Now, the story goes, and the, and the story's kind of important. I, I breezed over it. But the patriarch that, that w- what is now called the fifth patriarch that Waning went to study with, um, he was getting old and he decided he needed to find a replacement. And uh, the head monk, uh, Shen Chu, um, was figured to be the replacement. I mean, he was the obvious Dharma heir. He had spent most of his life. He had been a general before. So um, he had spent like 20 years serving the master, running the temple, had great understanding of Buddhism. And the first part of his life, and this was not uncommon, the generals, and we see it in Japan all the time, the only honorable uh, in, in, in medieval times, the only honorable death other than to kill themselves was to enter the monastery because you left behind all your status and everything. So there was a kind of killing of the personality or suicide of the personality, hopefully. And you get transformed into this bald-headed, black robe wearing egoless <laughs> person, right? And so here we have the head monk. He was a, he was a general and uh, probably a bandit. Most of the generals were. When there wasn't a war to fight, they just went out and pillaged villages to get the food and the goyles and anything else that was there. And uh, so he probably led a pretty spicy life. And he comes to live at the monastery, studies with the master, is a very, very good monk. And the master says, I'm going to pick my successor now. And you don't hear many succession stories. Uh, Shakyamuni did not pick a successor. Uh, at his death, he left everybody to flounder about, and uh, you know he told them that you have my words, you have my dharma to guide you, because they they asked, they said, who are you going to put in charge? And he said, well, you have my words, you have my dharma. And so there was a breaking apart. People gathered around teachers, which I'm sure that he expected to have happen. But this monk decided that he was going to pick a successor, so he told him, write a poem. Write a poem to expressing your understanding, and the one that expresses the greatest understanding will become my successor and take over this monastery. Now, he wasn't thinking back then of the patriarchate. You know, it wasn't like that, because I doubt seriously that he thought of himself as a patriarch. It was only later that he was called a patriarch. So he uh, went out during the third watch when it was dark, and he wrote on the wall, without signing it, because he said to himself, and I think it's very telling about this monk, that he was concerned that if he didn't get the the robe and the bowl, the symbols of succession to the master, that he had wasted 20 years. But it wasn't just the wasting of the 20 years that he had been wrong, that he was a fraud, that he felt very comfortable in his practice of Buddhism. And this was the final test. And we're going to talk a little bit about testing today and why we test. And and I have a great empathy for this monk because the way the, the Sixth Patriarch writes it, he makes him a very human person. It would be a very natural thing after dedicating half of your life, adult life, to something to find out that you've been wrong all the time. Kind of like that 82-year-old Republican, you know, that had ruined friendships and, um, you know, gotten fights and everything and then found out he was wrong. So he went out and he, and, he, and he took his brush and he took his ink and on the wall he painted a poem but didn't sign it. He was going to wait and see because he figured he'd, you know, just have to leave if he didn't do it right. So his poem went, the body is a Bodhi tree, the mind a bright, mirrored stand, whisk it continuously and zealously, allowing no dust to cling. And when the fifth patriarch saw this, he said, this is a wonderful poem. Everyone should memorize this poem. Put it in your heart and recite it every day as you rise. What a great poem. Because, of course, this this poem express the idea of always being mindful, always watching what you're doing. As I was saying earlier, you know, the Buddha advised, think three times about what you're going to say. But of course, not not have a conversation about it, 
But be careful about what you say. Be careful where you put your foot. And so here was this wonderful poem about daily practice. And the fifth patriarch, Hung Jin, knew without a doubt that this person was not awakened. But this person certainly had grasped the basic principle of Zen practice as handed down from Bodhidharma. That mindfulness, that's the other side of the meditation thing. You know, we've got the meditation, we've got the mindfulness. Somewhere between the two is the reflection. We shouldn't be reflecting in the meditation hall. It's a temptation that's hard. Everybody does it, right, Sandy? Everybody reflects when they meditate. But that's the kind of the goal here of practice is not to reflect in the meditation hall, to meditate. So here is this great reflection poem. But it's not a meditation poem. And everybody was agog. And everybody figured out who did it. One of the things about being the head monk is you're the logical choice. Being head monk prepares you for the responsibility of being the abbot. And some traditions make a lot out of it, this idea of being the head monk. Because the next step certainly could be running your own center or running your own place or taking over for the tired old master. And something people don't realize is a lot of times masters, when they get old, too old and too infirm, they retire. But they stay at the temple. And they're taken care of, you know, when they have a hard time getting up at 4 o'clock in the morning. And they have a hard time getting from here to there or doing the bows or something. Very often someone takes over for them. So, natural choice. Totally natural choice. Well, we have Wei Ning, who's still a youngster. And he's down working in the thrashing room, cleaning the, the, the rice. And he hears this poem, and so he wants to see it. Now, the sutra tells us that he couldn't read, so he got down there, and someone, a a government-type official, was wandering by. And you knew what everybody was in those days because they dressed the part. Government officials wore a certain kind of clothes. And so he asked him, you know, Venerable Sir, could you please read this poem for me? And the guy kind of went, well, you know, I'm really busy and everything. Well, he talked him into it, and he read the poem to him. And Wei Ning went, hmm. Do you think that you could write a poem for me? And so Waning's poem was written by this official on the wall. And his poem went, The very essence of Bodhi has no tree, nor is there a bright mirrored stand. In reality, there is nothing. So what is there to attract any dust? And we have this wonderful practice poem, and we have this wonderful realization poem expressing the reality without opinions. So, when the master read that, he called Wei Ning to his room. He started to instruct him in earnest. And he, after some time, he decided that Wei Ning was awakened, and he transferred to him the robe and the bowl. And he told him it would be the last time that it would be passed on. Now, the robe was supposed to be the robe of Bodhidharma in the bowl of Bodhidharma. So these monks had kept this rope and bowl down through the sixth, to the sixth patriarch. And the fifth patriarch told Wei Ning, he said, from now on you won't pass this on. Okay, you'll simply pass on the mind seal or the recognition that someone has awakened. But you won't pass on the rope and bowl anymore. The things that Waning gave us was, to reiterate if I haven't done it already, here we have a lay person, here we have a young person who has awakened. And so it takes away this idea that it takes years and years and years and years of practice. And so Waning, when his school is given a name, it's given the sudden school. Because Waning didn't have years of practice of meditation. What he did was he let go of everything. And he saw reality as it was. So that name sudden comes from that. And so now you have a school that criticizes these people that have been practicing for 40 years, haven't seen their true nature, and they keep plugging away at it because they think that they should be able to do it quickly, like Wei Ning did. Um, This transmission was very important. It's the first recorded transmission. 
And from then on, even though he said, well, the robe and the bowl won't be passed, there is a kind of a, a problem that happens in the Zen school. If we look down this list of people, we'll see that after waning, number eight was Matsu Taui. Matsu is the most famous of monks because he had hundreds of Dharma heirs. I just wanted to jump down to Matsu because Matsu was called Father Ma. And that's because he was he had so many disciples. He was very long-lived, and he had so many disciples that were Dharma heirs. And there was no way that a robe and bowl could be passed off to all those disciples, not Bodhidharma's robe and bowl. So a tradition starts after Hui Ning that what the master passes on is his robe and bowl. And maybe he doesn't even give a robe. Or maybe someone's cranking robes out in the back room. The master wears it for a week and gives it to the next enlightened disciple. I don't know. We, we had that from Hui Ning.